Falsha, welcome to the March 17th City Council meeting. I am Jim Nash, I am the City Council President, and I will be presiding this evening. This meeting and all participating on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. Tonight we are operating under our new rules and we will be doing things a little different than in previous years. We will first convene the meeting before we take public comment. I call the council to order. Laura, will you please take the roll? <laughs> Councilor Elkins. Here. Councilor Foster. Here. Councilor Gore. Here. Councilor Jarrett. Here. Councilor Labarge. If I need to unmute. Works for me. But I see if asking to unmute works. Councillor Labarge? I'm here. Oh, there she is. Thank you. Councillor Maori? Here. Councillor Moulton? Not present. Um, Councillor Nash? Here. And Councillor Perry? Here. Council President, you have a quorum. Thank you, Laura. Now that we are convened, we will take public comment. If you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. The raise hand feature is in the bottom menu bar under reactions. If you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you are having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me to ensure equal access and because of open meeting law, Technical problems such as not being able to raise your hand are the only thing that, that the chat function is used for and the chat function will only be available during public comment. We cannot accept comment over chat, private chat or chat only visible on Zoom during a public meeting is antithetical to an open public process in violation of the council rules for public participation and violates the spirit and potentially the law of open meeting law. If you want to submit a written public statement, please e email it to citycouncil at northamptonma.gov and it will be sent to all counselors and will be part of the public record. I will unmute each raised hand in the order raised to make a comment before you begin please state your name and your city or town for the public record. To ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, the council limits comments to two minutes. You are in no way obligated to use the full two minutes, but if you do, after two minutes, I will ask you to please finish your sentence. Tonight, we will also be trying out a new timer, which will appear in the Zoom to help track the two minutes. According to the council rules, we do not respond during public comment, as it is your time to speak. So while your comment should be directed to us, you will understand when we do not respond. Our rules also state the counselors and members of the public shall conduct themselves with civility and respect at all times. Your protected speech is a constitutional right and one that we ask you to wield with consideration and respect for all with recognition that the public space that grants you that freedom is shared equally by everyone. Also, according to open meeting law, if someone is, is disrupting a meeting, they may be removed. You may speak on any topic. It doesn't need to be on a, a, an item on the agenda. I ask that all but the council turn off your video until called upon. Only the person recognized has the floor and all comments are to be directed to the council. The meeting, this meeting can also be watched on channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media's YouTube and other platforms. So let's begin public comment. It looks like first up is Nan. Oh, I muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's unmute again. 
<laughs> I'm gonna stop. Karen, are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I didn't do anything, Jim. Okay. Nan, you have the floor. My apologies for my fumbling around there. Nancy Smith, Chapel Street. I would like to present more current math, which does not demonstrate the same need for a city kennel as perhaps 2016 figures did. More dogs being chipped and work from home has changed things. Let's assume the high of two dogs most weeks or 100 dogs per year in our care. From our ACO statement, 80 to 90 of those 100 dogs are now chipped and taken directly home or picked up at the police station within a few hours. This leaves only 10 to 20 stray dogs per year requiring boarding. 10 to 20 dogs per year. That is a very low number to invest in, in a million dollar city kennel when our animals are welcome in a new empty city kennel in Amherst. The ACO drop off and pick up to Amherst requires about three hours per dog. Adding 10 or more ACO hours per week would be far less expensive and far more effective in getting leash laws enforced and calls answered. Those boarded animals can be in Amherst for up to 10 days. If we spend a million dollars on our own duplicate city kennel, our ACOs would need to be inside the kennel daily, 100 to 200 days per year for care, feeding, mandatory exercise, as well as for mandated chemical cleaning to be done by state certified employees. The care and maintenance of a city kennel that we don't need will take up far more ACO time and escalate city costs far beyond what they are now. Even if all our current animal control expenses were for boarding, it would take 40 years just to break even on the building alone. Our school's need for this money is far more dire than any perceived need for a city kennel based on old 2016 data. This plan is no longer fiscally or morally responsible. I am asking the mayor to please take a fresh 2022 look at all facts, cost, resident health risks, and please stop this plan from moving forward now. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Next up is Claudia Levko. Hi, this is Mac Everett, her, her husband. Hello, Mac, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, Councilors, a few years ago, your predecessors passed new zoning that emphasized infill. They did so in good faith. Fortunately, we have some new affordable housing, an excellent result. We also now have a robust crop of shiny luxury housing for buyers who can plunk down three quarters of a million dollars. Our zoning also encourages squeezing as many units as possible onto infillable lots. Here's a current case. At 107 William Street, developers are set to demolish a partially renovated small house and shoehorn eight 800 square foot market rate condos onto its quarter acre lot. Under current rules, they will do this by right. A mature Norway spruce, fruit trees, a wheelchair ramp and gardens are all in the way and will be destroyed. Meanwhile, William Street is a narrow side street with aged stormwater system, crumbling sidewalks and heavy cut through traffic. I am not against thoughtful infill. Building affordable one, two or three family units would dovetail with existing properties, but shoehorning eight units onto 11,000 square feet, that's not infill, that's overfill. Is that the infill counselors foresaw when they voted for those latest zoning changes? I doubt it. I appeal to you to consider making revisions to the code. Some might say, forget it, the horse is out of the barn. I respectfully ask you deciders to go back to the barn where your predecessors, no doubt in good faith, let out a horse that is damaging our neighborhoods and if unchecked, will do so far into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. So I'm going to then, I'm next. Claudia, Claudia you have the floor. You I'm have two minutes. I'm also reading a statement from Brian, um, from David Farrell at 113 Williams. I don't see the clock running. Please don't start it. He is um, ill and cannot take, uh, do this on his own. So he's asked me to read a statement. So I'll read his and then I will read mine. Yeah, but is there a clock going? I don't see it. There is if you put on the gallery. Okay, well, anyway, all right, so start, start. This is from David Farrell, 113 William Street. 
I'm in a butter living at 113 William Street. My family has been in this house since my grandfather bought it in 1910. Five generations of the Farrell Yeske family have lived here. My main concern with 107 is water. The property was elevated many years ago, raising it above mine. What sits on 107 William Street now is a small house and garage. There's enough permeable area to absorb water. However, proposed project will cover most of the property with buildings and a parking lot. So where will the displaced water go? I'm afraid it'll drain down on my property. My property already has serious water problems that began in 2004 when City View condominiums along the railroad track behind and uphill from William Street were built, despite the lack of adequate stormwater drainage capacity in the neighborhood. What's there at City View is a drain ditch and a pipe that takes runoff under Hockenham Road to the sewage plant. They aren't hooked up to the William Street sewage system, drainage system. The city responded to my problem with flooding with a sump pump, a one and a half inch pump and a pump, which I've been required to maintain. So far, I've replaced it three times, each time costing $150. I also must pay the electricity. If the development goes forward as planned, I want two things. The developer to erect a six foot stockade fence between my property and the condominiums. And secondly, I want the developer working with the city to install a drainage system that resolves my water situation with a system that will accommodate runoff from 107 as well as water from my property. Water that already exists and what I expect will be even more water in the future. I shouldn't have to bear the responsibility and burden of maintaining an inadequate drainage system on my property. That's a responsibility for the city. Thanks. Oh, I see the clock, very big. Okay, now I'll go on to Claudia Lefko. Oh, I see, blue sky timer. I'm going to go on to Claudia Lefko. I'm here to ask the city council to intervene in an already approved project on 107 William Street. There are large profits to be made from properties in our Montview neighborhood, uniquely situated downtown, yet on the edge of the city with a rural feeling to it. Many of the houses, including the one targeted for demolition are described by the historic commission as vernacular, built to accommodate workers at the former silk mill on William Street. Farmers also occupied these small houses, farming in the fields and the meadows. There's history here that's being destroyed by the info policies coming from city planning and enacted into law by a string of mayors and city councilors over the last 10 and 15 years. I'm asking two things. One, for the city to approach the developers, Mr. Anuj Damaja and Amherst realtor, Stacy Ashton, and propose buying the property from them for the price they paid. $208,000 and any development fees already incurred. So the property renovations can be completed and the property put on the market as affordable housing rather than at market value estimated at $400,000 for each of the eight half condos. We need more affordable housing. There are plenty of market rate condos for sale in our neighborhood. And secondly, I'm asking any councillors that stand to benefit from current infill and zoning regulations, councillors with developable lots, including my council, councillor and neighbor Jim Nash, I'm asking them to recuse themselves from any discussions and decisions involving infill policies and zoning. There's a perceived conflict of interest here, even if there is currently no intention to sell or make a profit from their property. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Sigrid. Welcome, Sigrid. Am I unmuted now? You are unmuted and Wonderful. you have the floor. Thank you so much. So my name is Sigrid Schmaltzer. I live with my partner and two children at 102 William Street, just kitty corner to the site of this proposed eight condo development. I'd like to start by saying something about the character of our neighborhood. We live in a little triangle bordered by the train tracks, I-91 and the wastewater treatment plant, which is just one block from us. And I say this to emphasize that we are not snooty people. So yes, we're talking about protecting our neighborhood, but it's not about concerns over decreasing property values as in rightly 
uh, disparaged NIMBY cases, but from rising property values that will price out people we want as our neighbors. And we are trying to protect it from very real traffic hazards that no amount of so-called mitigation could possibly solve without tearing the entire neighborhood down and starting from scratch. So talk about planning. William Street is a really narrow street with very narrow sidewalks. This neighborhood was simply not planned for lots of cars going up and down. It was for factory workers who were going to walk to their jobs at the silk factory down the street. In the time that we have lived here since 2005, We've seen people crash into the telephone pole in front of our house at least twice. My father almost got swiped by a car when he was standing on the sidewalk. That's how narrow this place is. This is a route that many neighborhood children take on foot or by bike to get to Bridge Street School and to the bus stops for JFK and NHS. More cars commuting down this street will significantly increase the hazard to them. At the planning board hearing the other day, we heard a reassurance that the developers were planning to fix the sidewalk in front of their property. This entirely misses the point. It's not just about the safety of pedestrians right in front of their property, it's about the safety all up and down the street because we're adding a dozen commuters to an already overwhelmed street. And if they're allowed to put eight units there and make a huge profit off of that development, what's to stop people all up and down the street from doing the same? At what point are we going to say this is unsafe? I suggest it's not safe right now. Thank you. Thank you, Sigrid. Next up is Molly Totman. Hi, can you hear me? Welcome. Hi, thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be brief. I just wanted to come and uh, voice my, continue to voice my extreme concern and disappointment for the continued progress, um, despite I think many um, valuable and important concerns over the dog kennel project at the um, former Moose Lodge property. Um, I would specifically like to ask that the mayor uh, respond to uh, the Pines Edge and uh, Emily Lane communities requests for a meeting. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I want to say is that I, <clears throat> at the um, last meeting where the mayor presented the slides on the sort of reasoning for this property, um, I understood that as an attempt to be transparent with us and the city but um, just wanted to say that the experience of this whole process does not feel transparent. Um, everything from the lack of data on the dogs, um, a detailed budget, uh, a plan for the environmental abatement. Um, it feels like there is a push to shove um, not so useful data towards us to quiet this, um, but it feels quite the opposite. So please, please, please consider meeting with us. Um, and we urge you to uh, consider also stopping the project. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. All right, next up is Chris. Hello, Chris. Hello, uh, my name is Chris. I'm from the Pines Edge area, and I've spoken to you several times about the whole kennel scenario. And I would like to consciously thank you for representing the citizens of Northampton, but I'm having a little trouble getting there because I feel we are not being heard. And if we're being heard, our concerns are being disqualified from any reaction or response by you. We email our concerns and questions and we get nothing back in return. We voted you in to represent us and the residents by the Moose Lodge have spoken in a majority opposing the dog kennel. 44 people out of 55 residents do not want this kennel here. Yet you continue to hammer the kennel into this area and not even acknowledge this as a viable concern. I've spoken to four realtors and confirmed our property values will reduce as well as the ability to sell in the future. I recall Marianne Labarge asking Wayne, hey Wayne, would you mind checking that out? Did you even consider following up on this? Not one of you has spoken on this issue and I find that kind of shameful. 
Uh, Wayne and the mayor love to throw around the words due diligence and inclusion, two words I have yet to experience. Due diligence would have started with an appropriate sound check, not the one Wayne Fiden did. I spoke with an environmental sound engineer firm and they kind of laughed at the Bluetooth cell phone technique that was done. Going forward, the people don't need to know the budget for this project, the cost of removing an asbestos lead building next to wetlands, may I add, the actual building of the kennel with what in my research is very expensive soundproofing that we have been promised. The running of the kennel, including liability insurance, building insurance, weekly cost of the kennel, cleaning it by a certified worker, et cetera. It's more than the mayor's stated budget of solar heating cooling. Where is the money for this yearly budget and overhead coming from? If we took the prison up on the land that was offered, we could make this a regional kennel with shared expenses and it would be in an area that would not involve neighbor participation, complaints or extreme expense. Thank, Thank you. you Chris. Thanks, Chris. Okay, next up is Amy. They keep, they keep moving around here. Okay, there we go. Amy, Hi. You, have the, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Amy Gilberg, I live at Pine's Edge and you've heard some of my uh, neighbors speak about the kennel. And I have a few concerns. First of all, I am a dog lover and I want my dog to be taken care of. And it's why my dog is chipped. My dog isn't gonna spend days in a kennel, maybe not even an hour once a chip gets red. So I'm concerned that the reason for a kennel is no longer valid. And I would love to see the numbers of why you think we should put a, a mil, almost a million dollar kennel out there when we're looking at a few dozen dogs a year that might stay there. That seems a huge waste of taxpayer dollars. I agree with Nan, she said it really well. I think we, I would like to see the, the, the problem that this kennel is trying to solve. I wanna see the numbers because it doesn't make sense to me. I am concerned about my property values. I am concerned about the wetlands. I am concerned about the traffic on that road, but mostly I'm concerned that we're making a big construction investment without sound numbers. So I'd really like to see more information forthcoming. I'd like to see, as, as uh, Chris said, I'd like to get our questions answered. Why aren't we getting our questions answered? If this is a transparent process, which is what I believe is the goal, why aren't we hearing from you about those questions that we're asking? So I encourage you to pause on this ill conceived idea that we need a massive animal control facility at the end of a dirt road residential area and look more deeply into what is it we are trying to solve with this expense. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Next up is Kim. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Kimberly Welcome. Lambert and I live at Pines Edge Drive. I'm here to speak once again, and I want the whole city to hear me, whoever listens to this now or later, to, I want the city to see what the government of Northampton is trying to do to our neighborhood and what the government of Northampton has been trying to do to other neighborhoods in our city. I've watched these meetings and participated for a few weeks and I hear over and over again, different neighborhoods feeling like the city's not hearing them, the city's not listening to them. Mr. Nash, Karen, Marissa, Jamila, Stan Moulton. You know, it's, you've got to make a change. You've got to do something else besides what you're doing. You've got to talk to us. I 100% support everything that Molly, Nan, Amy, and Chris have said tonight. The data does not support an expenditure of almost a hundred a million dollars for the, the taxpayer shouldn't have to pay for that. And considering the devaluation of homes in my neighborhood, as a condo owner, I'm extremely concerned that my neighbors are going to have to sell their property. I don't want them to leave. 
because of a decision that you've made. The sound check was not valid. It should have been done by a professional and it wasn't. It didn't take into consideration the dogs that will be in the parking lot, barking back, responding to the dogs inside the kennel, if there are any dogs in the kennel. I urge you to keep looking for a regional space, reconsider that again, and trade this land for conservation purposes or return it to the indigenous people. I'm concerned about what I see our city doing to neighborhoods in our town. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Um, it looks like uh, uh, Gwen would like to make a comment. Hello. Welcome, Gwen. I'm actually not here for for that. I'm here because um, I'm I'm actually I live in public housing in Northampton, and um, you know we're we're a close knit community. And um, today we we got a notice um, that we're not allowed to garden here, and. I know this has been an issue in the past in Northampton. You know, it's, I'm not saying anything that isn't already known publicly, but for many people that do live in public housing, our, our gardens are our medicine and they've been our medicine for people who are vulnerable, who can't leave their house. Um, you know, they're a source of coping with, you know, anything from past trauma to, to coming into a new place from, from a wild world. Um, you know, gardens are simple. They're so simple. And, um, you know, many of us have had letters written from, from doctors and things like that. But this continues to be what I feel is really a human rights issue and a cultural issue. And so I'm not here to say, don't put something in my backyard. I'm here to say, we are public housing residents. We have cultures. We have ways of living that matter. And, and I know that I want that to be honored. So any kind of attention we could get to that um, would be great. And I'm sorry if this is the wrong place to speak of this, but I just feel that we needed some support. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, last call for public comment. Okay, seeing no virtual hands or real hands, let's see. <laughs> Okay, um, we're gonna move on from public comment. Um, thank you everybody for sharing. Uh, next up on the agenda is the uh, announcement of a public hearing. Um, announcement of a public hearing to consider the FY 2023 water and sewer rates. The Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing by remote participation on Thursday, March 31st, 2022 at 7 p.m. The City Council will consider the proposed fiscal year 2023 water and sewer rates and hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. Instructions for ac accessing the hearing may be found on the March 31st, 2022 City Council agenda to be, to be posted on the City website at www.northhamptonma.gov no later than 48 hours prior to the meeting. Um, also here, I'm going to put in a plug for a, there will be a joint planning board and um, a council committee on legislative matters, uh, uh, hearing, public hearing on a package of zoning, uh, uh, ordinances for form-based codes. That will be on 
uh, March 24th at 7 p.m. Um, the reason that wasn't on there is we haven't referred those items just yet, but I wanted people to know about it while I was announcing the public hearings. Um, but I, I anticipate we will make those referrals a little later in the meeting. Um, okay, now we move on to announcements. Um, uh, the mayor is here with a proclamation. Um, mayor Shara, you have the floor. Thank you, good evening, everybody. Um, it is my honor to read this proclamation and recognize um, that March is Brain Injury Awareness Month. Whereas every nine seconds, someone in the United States sustains a brain injury. And whereas more than 3.5 million children and adults sustain an acquired brain injury, but the true total is unknown since so many go unreported. And whereas at least 5.3 million Americans live with long-term disability as a result of traumatic brain injury. And whereas the leading cause of traumatic brain injuries are falls and motor vehicle crashes. Whereas brain injury does not discriminate, it's unpredictable in its consequences, affecting who we are, the way we think, act, and feel in a, manner of in a matter of seconds. And whereas there are many ways to reduce the chances of traumatic brain injury, including wearing seatbelts while in any motorized vehicle, using appropriate headgear for sports participation, removing hazards from the home, making living areas safer, and performing regular safety checks in recreational areas, whereas improved treatment, better access to care, educational and responsible legislation are major considerations when addressing needs surrounding brain injury, but the most important and powerful tool is prevention. Now, therefore I, Mayor Jean-Louise Shara, do hereby proclaim the month of March, 2022 to be Brain Injury Awareness Month. Let us support organizations and programs that assist residents with traumatic brain injury along with their families, but also educate our community about the extent, causes, consequences, treatment, and prevention of traumatic brain injury. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the seal, the city seal on this 10th day of March in the year 2020, Mayor Gina Louise Shara. So thank you all for letting me, thank you. And thank you to Mary who, who asked for us to, um, to recognize this month. So thank you so much for helping me recognize that everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mary. Are there any other uh, announcements? Councillor Perry. Well, thank you. I just want to let the public know and everyone know that uh, next Monday, the 21st, there is a community resources uh, meeting and we will be having a discussion about the Rotary Club's upcoming day of service and how we can uh, be active in that. And there will also be an update from the Department of Community Care Director, Sean Donovan. So anyone who's interested in that should come please join us. Thank you, Councilor Perry. <coughs> uh, Councilor Foster. Thank you, Councilor Nash. And thank you, Mayor, Mayor Shara. Um, and on the note of March being Brain Injury Awareness Month, a nonprofit very near and dear to me, my heart will be distributing bike helmets um, on Pleasant Street, adult-sized bike helmets at no charge, um, thanks to funding and um, a request from another organization. So at 297 Pleasant Street on March 29th from 12 to 5 p.m., All Out Adventures will be distributing um, bike helmets um, at no charge. And so if you have a helmet that's more than three to four years old or that has ever been in a crash or you don't yet have one, um, come on down um, for a free helmet. Um, and then the April 4th city services meeting, I wanted to let folks know that Brian Foote, the director of arts and culture will be joining that meeting. That's at five o'clock. Um, he had hoped to join us in March, um, but we needed to delay his joining us um, until the April 4th meeting. And then Councilor Nash, do, um, We've emailed, um, this, there's, there will be an application form coming up very soon for the city council select committee um, to increase, to um, study the barriers to service on various city boards and commissions, um, as well as to make recommendations for change. That application um, will be distributed um, very, very soon um, through the Gazette. Uh, we'll drop off to places where people gather. We'll make announcements at city council meetings as well as to chairs of various um, city boards and commissions um, and ask people to apply by mid-April um, so that that committee's work can get underway. 
Thank you, Councillor Foster. Councillor Labarge. I think you're muted, Councillor. I think I will. There you go. I just want to wish everybody um, a happy St. Patrick's Day. And even though my last name is Labarge, my husband's mother is a full, was a full-blown Ryan. And a lot of people today, even today, called me about the breakfast this morning. And I wish I could have been there. I wish I could also do the parade on Sunday. But sometimes you can't be where you want to be. So anyways, thank you, everybody who's been calling me. And happy St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, Counselor. So I'm actually going to pick up on that, Counselor LaBarge. Um, okay. So people have commented that I'm wearing a tie tonight. And um, <laughs> I'm wearing a tie that um, I, 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 Councillor Labarge might be familiar with this. Back when we met in person, whenever we would have a big vote on a, a budget item, I would, I thought it proper to wear a tie to council. Yep. And um, so, uh, with uh, the the sip on the agenda tonight, I am wearing a tie. The tie I am wearing it was given to me by my grandfather, whose name was James Bernard Nash. He seniors. <laughs> I am James Bernard Nash III. It sounds very regal, my name, uh, but my grandfather was born in Kansas City, Missouri in 1888. Um, his mother died when he was very young. Uh, uh, he never finished eighth grade and he um, was successful as a salesman selling uh, 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 Lee work gear jeans to uh, general stores throughout Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. So in honor of my, my Irish heritage here, I'm wearing this tie, and I'd like to wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day. And, um, and, um, and, and it was a real pleasure to be at the, the breakfast this morning. So happy St. Patrick's Day, folks. Um, the other item that we have under announcements here is is kind of a non-announcement because on an earlier version of our um, agenda, we had a suggested schedule change for our council meetings. And in the flurry of things that have come forward in the last few days, uh, Laura and I worked on this with the mayor's office and we basically arrived at uh, that we, did, we shouldn't change anything. Um, and that um, some of this has been to accommodate the um, the change in schedule in April to uh, accommodate um, uh, counselors with children. I'm fully behind that idea as, as somebody who had young kids once. And I, I, I think this is a, a, a worthy adjustment. And it seems like uh, we've managed to pull it all together. We're gonna get our, our water rates hearing in and, um, and that, uh, that we've lined things up so that the mayor who has a conflict at our for our April meeting, that we, it should be that she doesn't have to be there. That her staff can cover for any of the items that will be at that meeting. So, um, so we don't have to discuss that any further. All right. Now we're going to get into our um, a little bit of uh, agenda acrobatics here. Um, next up on the agenda, I would like to pull up. Um, I want, is Carolyn here? Let's see if Carolyn's available. Yes, so um, what I'd like to do is, uh, Carolyn's going to do a brief introduction of the zoning package, which uh, we will uh, later be discussing a, a referral for, and I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, bring that up right now. And, um, and I'm anticipating that this discussion uh, won't be terribly lengthy. And then we can get into our, our more detailed discussion about the, the capital improvement plan next. So is Carolyn here? Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, un let me unmute her. Let's see. She's a co-host, so you should be able to unmute Carolyn. I don't see her here. She's here. He's here. 
Carolyn, did I surprise you? You may have. Yeah, I think I surprised her. Not sure okay. she thought it would come up so soon. I can try and contact her. You know what? Uh, let's, uh, based on that, let's simply go to- uh, Wait, she's unmuted now. All right, where is she? Right here. She is. <laughs> Carolyn, I surprised you. My apologies. You absolutely did. <laughs> um, so you ready to um, do the introduction? Is that the... Yes. So uh, yeah. right now we have... All right. Let me get straight because we're jumping around here. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah. So Carolyn is going to introduce the, um, the form-based code zoning package. And then, um, and then uh, we'll look over it. Well, I, I'll, I'll just do a brief overview of what these different ordinances are. And then we're going to talk about um, referral to, uh, leg to the planning board and legislative matters. So Carolyn, if you're ready to do a, a little uh, 10 minute intro, you have the floor. <laughs> I will, thank you so much. Um... Okay, I'm going to, um, Laura, can I screen share? Yes, you should be able to. Okay, great. Thanks. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Oops. Um, okay, good evening. <laughs> um, this is a pleasant surprise. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, the Form-based code is a big package that was submitted to you all um, for this week for referral out to public hearing. And so I'm just gonna run through it quickly. The official public hearing as Councillor Nash mentioned is next Thursday. Um, and we'll, where we can go into much more detail about these items. Form-based code, just briefly, I'll go through what it is, why we're doing it, and what areas of the city it um, will affect if the city council um, um, adopts the zoning amendments. So it's Florence Center and downtown Northampton. Um, first off, form-based code is um, sets, uh, establishes rules for design and the use of um, properties within one document. Um, <laughs> it differentiates this code in particular and what form-based code generally does is looks at different areas of the um, district in which it will be applicable. And based on those uh, underlying characteristics of the district, there are different um, form and design rules to match what's there. So um, what this code will do is um, take what we've already, what we already have um, in downtown Northampton for design and sort of merge that with the use tables and um, sort of look at it as a package and provide more fl uh, flexibility and predictability about both the private um, side or the building um, development side, but also any improvements that might be necessary or might be triggered by any new investment on the public space. So the sidewalks and that interface between um, the street and the buildings. The goals are to create a um, diagram that puts forth a vision for the future evolution of spaces in our core downtown and village centers and enhance the pedestrian experiences by framing the streets with buildings and creating um, active interface between those buildings and the street. Um, and the code is also intended to have so much details that um, not to be overly complicated, but to sort of lay out a clear path for um, both the public, but also anybody who is interested in um, building a new building or an addition. Um, so that it's, the standards are very clear and um, um, enumerated in the code. And the reason why we're proposing this is a sort of um, newer way of addressing or modified way of addressing uh, land use regulations for both Florence Center and downtown Northampton is again to sort of set a vision for the public private interface 
create more predictability for private investment, modernize the zoning so that it's reflective of what the current market demands are, the changes in retail and commercial trends that have been progressing over the last 10, 20 years um, to allow different uses that are now um, uh, in higher demand and also to um, modify some of the zoning that um, doesn't currently allow uses that um, um, are in higher demand. The code change will also provide new opportunities for multifamily housing, dining and affordable commercial space on um, side streets sort of open up uh, possibilities for that. It creates a zoning for Florence Center that's distinct from some of the highway districts. So right now Florence Center is zoned general business, which is the same zoning classification that we have in other parts of town. So this would um, create a, a, a regulatory framework for Florence Center that's sort of it's unique to that character and so it's reflective of that. It also achieves uh, some objectives or tries to achieve some objectives in the sustainable Northampton to encourage more mixed use in Florence Center to encourage infill of vacant and underutilized land in both downtown Northampton and Florence Center and Florence um, Village surrounding streets. Reinforce downtown as a distinct regional center um, and ensure that downtown and village centers are universally accessible. So those are some of the objectives identified in the uh, recently adopted Sustainable Northampton and we feel like this is a good, um, that this code sort of acts to um, help achieve some of those. You all may know that we've, this has been a long process. We started this um, zoning um, initiative in 2018. We hired a consulting firm, Dodson and Flinker, to help us through this. And they conducted um, several focus groups in um, Florence, um, downtown Florence, as well as downtown um, Northampton. We had public forums throughout 2018, 2019, and then slowed down a bit in 2020, 2021. But uh, meetings also then went virtually and there were meetings with stakeholder groups, businesses, property owners, and so forth. And then we just wrapped up sort of this final public forum back in January before submitting this package to council just to sort of um, bring full circle um, what, all that work that has gone into this effort over the last, I guess now, um, four years almost. Just to quickly go over um, the existing conditions in Florence Center, which we'll go into more detail next week. There are two, essentially two zoning districts that um, are encompass most of Florence Center. So this is the pink area is general business district and this is Main Street um, running um, basically um, north south. So Look Park is up this way. This purple is an office industrial um, zone that doesn't allow the same kind of um, uses that are allowed in this general business district. So that's what this um, new code would um, address. The proposed zoning map, would, um, we can, we can um, fiddle with the colors, but just generally to outline the different characteristics, we would, this purple, this area that is currently office industrial would be brought into the commercial zone. So that's again, sort of looking at creating more flexibility with the reuse of that mill building, where now retail and commercial type uses are not allowed but the building is clearly being used for that. And you can see that there's demand. And so that's the kind of thing where um, I mentioned previously that um, the zoning needs to be updated to really reflect what the demand is and where interest is in creating those commercial spaces. So this would be brought into a Florence Village general um, district. These, there's three parcels here on the north end of Florence Center, which um, includes the Lilly Library, Florence um, um, Civic Building, and then also the, the formerly the Seventh Adventist Church. Those are urban residential B, but they're all, they're um, sort of cultural institutional um, uses and buildings that are sort of part of that core of Florence. So we bring them from a residential zoning to 
into the commercial, and that would be the edge instead of um, one parcel in. And then these darker pink areas would be the core um, village center commercial districts. And the difference between the darker and the lighter pink is really about the uses that are allowed and ground floor in particular, ground floor residential uses would be relegated to the back of properties or the back of structures in these darker pink areas, where um, in the lighter pink, the difference would be that you could have multifamily housing um, in those lighter pink areas. So all the way from the ground floor up. And that's different from today's standard in the general business district where no residential uses are allowed at all on the ground floor. And the idea behind that originally was to create and make sure that there was a vibrant street front with active commercial uses um, at the street level. Um, but at this point in time, it really makes sense to, we feel based on um, feedback from throughout these public um, meetings that more multifamily residential would actually help support the, the core spine of Main Street and the um, bit of the side streets in Florence Center. And so that's the impetus for, the, for looking at those kinds of changes. Um, and I'll just quickly run through this. These are just sort of pictures of where we'd look at where those dark pink um, spots would be. Um, again, sort of differentiating sections of Florence Center. So treating them a little bit differently based on existing character. So this lower, these lower pictures in the lower left-hand corner represent sort of the two hot pink nodes where you, we would really focus um, commercial development at the street front and not residential there, um, allow uh, addition of hotels, manufacturing, entertainment, um, and for new buildings and major additions, there would be specificity about the form and design requirements. Um, that's also applicable for the general zoning, what we're calling Florence Village General, which would be sort of those in-between spaces and, the, and more further down the side streets of Maple um, and a, a little bit along Chestnut. And so that's where we would or could see potentially increased opportunities for um, housing development from the ground up. And we already have that in some buildings. Um, so it would allow them, it would essentially say that these are conforming uses. Um, for downtown Northampton, similarly, it would be an adjustment of zoning. We have four um, um, commercial districts and we sort of redistribute those into three districts with a few um, add-ons from urban residential C and office industrial on um, Pauley Street. But for the most part, these are existing commercial districts that would be redistributed. So we'd have three um, uh, downtown um, central business gateway, which represents this northern section up almost uh, basically to the bike path, the gateway corridor on King Street to, at the bike path down to um, Summer and Fenn Street, at which point there would be a transition to what we're calling central business um, side street. And then the dark pink here is the core um, um, of central business. So Main Street and a little bit of Pleasant and King. And then um, all the way up to the edge here, State Street would be the core. And then again, sort of looking at side streets surrounding that and then a gateway district, which would be a conversion of general business south of Hockenham Road all the way down to the roundabout um, would transition. And so what this does is it would sort of um, transition the jurisdiction for design review that already exists in, for downtown Northampton to um, the core would be uh, uh, reviewed, new projects would be reviewed by the Central Business Architecture Committee still and jointly with the planning board. Um, but it, it sort of focuses those core, um, that core historic area and sort of the, the brick fabric of the downtown would have one set of rules. Then on the side streets, there would be slightly modified rules for setbacks and design elements to be reviewed by planning board. So these are examples of um, areas that fall within that sort of lighter pink area of side streets sort of off the main street. And again, it relates to uh, what housing opportunities might uh, could be available 
uh, in these areas. So supporting or encouraging multifamily housing that would support that core um, commercial uh, spine in downtown Northampton, creating flexibility, updating allowed uses for assisted living and, as well as manufacturing in addition to the ground floor housing. Um, and then finally, the gateway district, which is the which are sort of on the, the entry points that are now either entrance business or general business. And again, sort of another um, set of standards for these areas because they are different um, in character than what we have on Main Street and Pleasant Street. So that is in a nutshell, what the um, objectives are of this zoning. And if anybody has any questions now, I'm not sure if that's what you wanted, Councillor Nash, but I'd be happy to answer them. And of course, we have the public hearing next week. Carolyn, that was terrific. That was a nice overview. So we have, a, we have an idea of what is gonna be discussed at the public hearing. Marcus, and um, glad ACLU Massachusetts. Yeah. Councillors, any- um, I didn't any get that. Any questions? Councillor Labarge. Yes, I, I just want to um, thank Carolyn. I really appreciate that presentation. And um, I think it looks great so far, but <laughs> I, I need to really go over all those um, zonings. But I did talk with Wayne on a couple of them this morning. So mm -hmm. but thank you, Carolyn. And I'm glad that you don't have to stay here all night. <laughs> I appreciate that. That's very nice of you all. I would also say if any of the counselors have any questions or any anybody um, can always email me or call um, with questions as this works through or anytime. Um, so feel free to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. So, um, so right now we are dealing with uh, item number 13, zoning ordinances. Uh, not yet referred. So we've had an introduction of the form, form based code. There are 14 different items here. I am, I understand there's over a hundred <laughs> pages associated with this. I am not going to read any of that into the record. No. Um, but I, I think um, I, I'd like to discuss whether we, we should refer this. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. <laughs> uh, I move that we move items A through N as a group to the planning board and legislative matters. I'll second that motion. Okay. Uh, any discussion about that motion? Hearing none and with people wanting to have a briefer meeting tonight, uh, Laura, roll call, please. Okay. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. <coughs> Councillor Moulton, let me make sure I've made you a co host. Um, Thank you. Okay. I, I now feel part of this. Yes. <laughs> okay. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay. All right. That has been referred to the planning board and, uh, and to legislative matters. Um, I, I, while everybody's here, uh, councillors, I just uh, want to let you know that uh, these will be public hearings and that um, during the public hearing that uh, I, I learned this the hard way during the last session that uh, the counselors not on the committee have their opportunity to speak and ask questions is during the public portion of the hearing. You are encouraged to attend and ask those questions, but once the public hearing portion is closed, then, um, then the, uh, in, in this case, it will, will be the members of legislative matters will have their discussions, deliberations. But I, um, I, I just want everybody. I'm going to. I'm encouraging or encouraging counselors to show up and uh, be part of the process. And uh, but just giving you a heads up on that. And the other thing is, 
we, um, we uh, legislative matters, if there is a need to keep the, the hearing open, legislative matters can uh, move to do that. And also when it comes back to council, um, if we, uh, if we want to do a little more exploration, we can do that as well. There is a clock ticking on this. We will be watching for that. Once the, the public hearing starts, it's uh, 90 days, correct, Laura? That's correct. Or so, once the public hearing is closed. Once it's closed. Thank 90 you. days to act. So, um, but I, I think um, we, we can get things done in that time frame. So anyway. Um, all right, on to the next thing. Um, the resolution for the uh, do, do, do. all this jumping around makes it harder to follow things. Yeah, you okay. are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so I wanted to. So now we're going to tackle the capital improvement pro program, and there are two parts to this. We have the the plan which um, is part of the resolution that is here for us to discuss. And um, I'd like to um, uh, put, a, uh, so item 22.030, a resolution to adopt the capital improvement program for fiscal year 2023 through fiscal year 2027, submitted to city council February 17th, 2022. Uh, it's here for uh, second reading. Um, and so that item is now on the floor for discussion. Move approval. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, the motion was made by Councillor Jarrett and seconded by Councillor Perry. Is there any discussion on the um, capital improvement program. Councillor Moulton. Uh oh. That's. I can't even unmute. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had one question about the, uh, the, the receipts reserved for parking, uh, which is. Uh, uh, budgeted at 31,000 for the fiscal year 23, uh, set to almost triple fiscal year 24. Is that in anticipation of a return to pre-pandemic levels? Uh, was that to me? Um, do you have a do you have a page number? So the finance director Nardi um, just unmuted, so she can probably answer this more quickly, but. As I'm looking for the page. It's page 11. Thank you. Fi uh, it's, it's the uh, summary of projected funding sources. So, so if I may, um, Councillor Moulton, um, yes, we actually um, do hope that um, parking will, will rebound um, back to, well, close to pre-pandemic, because I think there's been some changes in the way people live. But um, we do think there's enough money to fund um, more in the future, but also there is there is money in that account as well. So we just try as as projects comes forward that fit that um, that fit the funding for that source, um, we use it, and we do feel that there will be plenty of money to fund that in the future to fund those projects in the future. Thank you. Any other question, thoughts? Councillor Foster. My my internet just cut out for like the last couple of minutes. Can you just catch me up? I know there's a motion on the floor. Can you just catch me up on what the motion is? <laughs> yes, uh, so there is a motion on the floor to approve the capital improvement program, the resolution for the capital improvement program. Well, I'll hop in then. Um, so I, I just want to say that I, I've spent considerable amount of time uh, going over this document and um, talking with uh, both the mayor and um, with uh, Director Nardi 
uh, uh, we've all spent a lot of time going on tours, meeting with directors of, of different departments, and that the, uh, it, it, in my assessment, there, this, there is a very sound funding plan that is behind this document. And that, um, and that all of the recommended improvements are, are needed or timely um, for those particular departments. And, um, and that uh, I, I plan to support the plan. Councilor Mould. Oh, he's the- He can't unmute. We have to make him a co-host. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to say that I'm very impressed with the adherence to the city's goal of, uh, of uh, municipal carbon neutrality by uh, 2030. By my count, there are uh, 18 uh, vehicles uh, uh, to be purchased in the uh, next fiscal year that would be either hybrid or electric. In addition to that, uh, I think there's substantial commitment to upgrading ventilation systems through uh, municipal buildings, as well as replacing some very, very old windows in a number of school buildings. That will produce not only uh, more energy efficiencies, but will also uh, result in healthier work and in the case of schools learning environments, which I think we've heard a lot about uh, during the pandemic. So I. I want to commend the mayor and her team for uh, for that aspect of the uh, capital improvement uh, program, particularly. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jarrett, and then I'll um, piggyback on that. Um, so yeah, first, very much appreciate uh, all the time and discussion and questions answered uh, last uh, two weeks ago. Um, but I appreciate the addition of the questions. Um, the, the the page um, about um, the climate impacts uh, of for climate resilience and um, mitigating climate change for each of the projects that's proposed that the department heads were asked to um, explain how the project uh, affects those um, and I understand it you know it's kind of a it's a new thing it's a difficult thing to to know the answers so. Not, not every project had had something filled out, but for for those that were, um, I, I appreciated that uh, they were that the thinking of behind um, you know to really justify uh, each project from that perspective. So thank you. Thank, thank. Can I just respond quickly? Thank you, Councilor Jarrett. Um, and I think we may have said this last time, but yes, this was a very new thing, and there wasn't a lot of sort of um, kind of development around it with the department heads. And so we plan on um, doing a lot more work with them and sort of refining the process and, and helping them be able to kind of give fuller answers and, and um, really respond to those requests um, in a way that, that um, is meaningful and, and sort of gives a greater understanding uh, for the plan as a whole, but for each individual project. So thank you. Councillor Labarge. Yes, um, I'm in the um, police department. When we did the tour with the Department of Public Works and it was shown to us about the cruisers that were not available anymore. And I'm looking at, and I've had emails and I've had some of my residents calling in regards of how pleased they were mayor of the going hybrid on their police cruisers. The only question I have is with the Ford Ranger, with the insert for the animal control and the pricing on it at 59,202 versus an unmarked Ford utility hybrid at 55,855. Why is not the Ford Ranger not being a hybrid? Um, so that, that was the one vehicle that was not available. Uh, there was not a hybrid option that was available that would be able to be outfitted in the way that it needed to be. Um, so, you know, as we've committed to the next time, um, another vehicle needs to be purchased, 
we, you know, every year we will check and see what's available. So unfortunately there's just not one uh, yet available that would be able to accommodate all the needs of that particular vehicle. Right, because I, I, I have to agree with the hybrid, especially for the environment and the climate change that's occurring. And plus the fact is with us defunding the police hurt them pretty bad because of the financial aspect of it, but we all pulled through it. And we heard Chief Jody Casper speak in regards to how it was serious that we replaced these police cruisers. So it's time and I'm happy about the hybrid. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Elkins. Uh, yes, I uh, just want to, I just want to uh, echo what um, uh, Councilor Jar Jarrett said uh, in that how pleased I am to see the integration throughout every level of um, the budgeting process and the city's procurement um, of environmental uh, and sustainability considerations. Um, as Councilor Jarrett said, that's a new addition to this process and uh, the department heads are coming up to speed on what kinds of uh, things we're asking for and asking them to look at, but I really appreciate the extra effort that they all went to, to get us more information about that. Um, I was involved in this process even before I was sworn in on, on the uh, uh, capital improvements advisory committee, I think is what it was called. Um, and it was a real crash course in all of this uh, and, and the city's needs and, and how thoughtful um, all the department heads are and uh, how we go about this process of determining what our needs are and considering carefully in terms of all of our priorities, including the budget uh, and the finances of it. And also, of course, sustainability and uh, other issues that we've decided as a community we, we need to prioritize and we value. So I'm very proud to have been a part of this and it's been incredibly educational to uh, see it through um, from the very beginning um, to this point. So I'll be proud to support it. Thank you, Councillor. And your perspective then before you were a city councillor and now during this process was has been very helpful. So I'm, I'm grateful for your participation on it. Thank you. Thank you. Counselors. <laughs> All righty. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to uh, approve the resolution for the capital improvement program. Um, seeing no more discussion. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, uh, that passes unanimously. Um, so uh, with that done, I would like to go back to the consent agenda where uh, not only does uh, a number of usual items that I'm gonna review, um, but also all of the financial orders uh, related to the capital improvement program. Mm. So I'm going to quickly run through the consent agenda and uh, any counselor can request a removal. Um, Okay, uh, item A, 22.028, appointment to the Board of Health, positive recommendation from City Services on 3-7-2022 is Dallas Ducar of 330 Elm Street, uh, Northampton, uh, uh, for the term running January 2022 to June 2025. Uh, item B, uh, 22.029, appointment to Arts Council and Human Rights Commission, positive recommendation, City Services Committee three, on 3-7-2022 three, to the Arts Council, Pete Olson of 380 South Street, Northampton. The term runs from February 2022 to June 2025. 
Human Rights Commission, Chelsea Sunday Klein of 42 Cherry Street. Term running from February, that's gotta be 2022 to June, 2025. Um, item C, uh, 22.016, appointments to various committees for referral to city services. To the Arts Council, Joella Tarbutton Springfield of 351 Pleasant Street, uh, number 163 in Northampton. The term would run from March 2022 to June 2025. Anna V.A. Polesny of 30 Aldridge Street, Northampton, term running March 2022 to June 2025. Energy and S Sustainability Commission, Commission, Victor McGarrell, 107 Island Road, Northampton, term running from March 2022 to June 2025. To the Housing Partnership, Gwen Nabod of 19D Hampshire Heights, Northampton, term March 2022 to June 2025. Beverly Bates uh, of 206 Emerson Way, Florence, term running 2022 to 2025. Those are those folks are uh, uh, for referred for um, review to uh, city services for the housing partnership. Parks and Recreation Commission, Kristen D Dar Dardano of 280 Elm Street, Northampton, term running from July, 2021 to June, 2024. And that's for reappointment. And then there's Glenn Conley of 49 Platinum Circle, Florence, term running uh, from July, 2021 to June, 2024. That is a reappointment. Um, I, I'd like to make a point of reading people's names into the records uh, who are serving on our boards. I, um, I, I really appreciate their, um, the work that volunteers do for our city. Um, okay, now we're on to items D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. And these are all financial orders uh, that we reviewed at the la last council meeting that are the, uh, the, the underlying financial plan to, uh, to make the, the capital improvement program work. Um, I'm not going to read each one of those. So are there any requests for removals from the consent agenda? Seeing no requests for removals. Laura, roll call, please. Okay. Oh, Councilor Gore. Are, are we voting before someone makes a motion or just someone make a motion? Oh, so, oh, I'm, so, sorry. so I, I'm so sorry. I do not have a motion on the floor. Yeah, you don't. All right. Good catch. Uh, okay. Would somebody like to make a motion? I'll put that motion on the floor. Second. Okay. Nice catch, Councillor Gore. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, okay, now Gore. we have a motion. <laughs> Um, all that reading tires me out. I, I, I forgot what's going on. So we have a motion on the floor. Uh, there's no cons uh, no discussion on the consent agenda. Um, if if there no if I see no requests for removal, Laura, roll call, please. Thank you, Councillor Gore. Yes, Councillor Jarrett. Yes, Councillor Labarge. Yes, Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. All right, that is done. Now we are going to just start cruising back through the agenda. And um, councillors, you will notice that what was the longest agenda you ever saw in your life has uh, like two thirds of it has been uh, uh, 
uh, taken care of. So let's see. Now we are up to we're up to number eight financial orders. Does that sound right, Laura? Am I on yeah. track? Okay. Yes, it does. All right. Financial orders in first reading. We have uh, so th these are orders that we are uh, going to uh, introduce tonight and uh, decide whether or not whether or not we are going to uh, refer them to finance or to the consent agenda uh, for our next meeting. Um, okay, item 22.044 in order to appropriate $3,000 in CPA funds for Laurel Park Historic Signage, uh, ordered that. Whereas the Leeds Civic Association submitted a small grants application for Community Preservation Act funding for signage for Laurel Park Historic Signage, whereas the project will preserve the unique history and culture of Laurel Park and the Chautauqua movement and its role in the development of Northampton, whereas the project has community support and was enthusiastically supported by the Northampton Historic Commission Whereas on February 16th, 2022, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Laurel Park Historic Signage Project, project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the mayor and the city council. Specifically, $3,000 is appropriated from the CPA budget reserve account. I'm not gonna read that number. Um, mayor, would you, um, or is Sarah here to speak to this? <clears throat> Sarah's not here. Um, this is one of those small grants that the CPA um, makes recommendations on and uh, if you had other questions um, that I can't cover, she would be happy to answer them at the next meeting. Um, but I, you know, I thought I could, it's fairly self-explanatory, um, I think, the order. So um, again, it's one of these small, you know, 3,000 or under grants that um, the CPA uh, has. So um, for Laurel Park, I hope you're all familiar with Laurel Park and um, which is, has a, uh, a very um, charming and lovely history in Northampton. And so this is signage for Laurel Park. Uh, Councillor Labarge, then Councillor Moulton. Yes, um, I think this is great with the lead civic association going forth with this and getting the support from the community and the historical commission. I, for $3,000, I think it's, they well deserve to have that sign put up. Councilor Moulton. Uh, yes, I too want to support this. Um, Laurel Park is one of those gems of Northampton that perhaps is, is not uh, fully appreciated by, by everyone. It was, uh, it was founded uh, in 1872. It's, it's, so it's celebrating its 150th anniversary uh, this year as part of the Chautauqua movement uh, of community driven centers for, for intellectual development and, uh, and artistic uh, activities. Uh, at its height in the, in the late uh, uh, 19th century, early 20th century, there were some 12,000 communities in the country that had these uh, Chautauqua camps. Um, including Northampton. And Laurel Park at one time drew as many as 5,000 to 6,000 uh, people, visitors, uh, for its uh, assemblies, uh, lectures, musical uh, music, and, and uh, uh, other artistic uh, uh, endeavors there. I think uh, signs really understates what's being proposed here. I talked to one of the organizers this week. What, what these are are uh, markers that will be put on the five uh, common buildings at Laurel Park that will display uh, text and photos from a rather extensive archive that Laurel Park has, which now is, is largely just in storage. This, is, this really will allow history to be uh, on display at Laurel Park, and these markers will be uh, formally 
uh, unveiled at a community celebration uh, on August 27th. So I, I think this is a, a great use of CPA money for um, historic, really a display of, of historic uh, material. Thank you for that history, Councilor Moulton. Yeah, that, that was pretty impressive. I was like, <laughs> in my mind, I was like, should we invite Sarah next time just to get a little more? I think we just had everything. Councilor Moulton doing the, the footwork once again as a seasoned reporter. He can't get it out of his system. Thank you, Stan. And um, that I also want to um, uh, that. Uh, just put out the word on these small grants with the CPA money. They're, they're actually, they're really great that, you know, there's different organizations in town that are, that are trying to um, uh, do small improvements. Um, uh, during a public comment, somebody mentioned something about gardens and I, I'm wondering if this could be, a, you know, a place where a small grant could be helpful. Um, but that's the kind of projects that, that the CPA is able to fund where there's a lot of volunteer activity and they just you know need to buy materials and uh, to get something going. So um, anyway, I, I'll fully support this of course, but everybody should make note of these. All right, any other discussion? Okay, so uh, could I get a motion for where to send this? Move yeah, on to the consent agenda. Second that. Okay. Motion was made by Councillor Foster, seconded by Councillor Labarge to refer to the consent agenda at the next meeting. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion. Laura, roll call. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Perry? Yes. Councillor Elkins? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. And Councillor Gore? Yes. Okay. All right, that has been sent to the consent agenda. Next item, uh, 22059, in order to transfer funds for health department title five inspections ordered that 13,000 from the fiscal year general fund undesignated fund balance free cash be appropriated and added to account health department inspections and $5,000 from the health department contracted inspection service be transferred to health department inspections to support a contract to con conduct title five inspections in fiscal year 22, 2022. Mayor. Yes. So we are seeking funding for um, contracted services for Title V. So these are services that we must provide. And this request is due to some unintended consequences of the pandemic. So um, our, our the health department sanitarian inspector uh, who did these um, left during during the pandemic and um during that time there was a lack of so you need to get training from that's led by the state um to be able to do these 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 licenses um and there was a lack of that professional training provided by the state um so it led to an inability for us to train um new people to provide these services um, and so we've had to, we need to contract for these services. So, um, and, and there's, it coincided with a, um, a lot of need for Title V services. So, so example of these services are septic plan reviews, um, septic inspections, perk tests, installation inspections, and soil evaluations. So this also coincided with a housing market boom where we needed to do a lot of inspections and um, we were not able to get people licensed to do them. So um, we are needing to contract uh, for those services. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna ask what Title V was and you, you just explained it. <laughs> All right. um, 
So counselors, on the floor is the discussion of where to refer this. Councillor Labarge. Yes, I would like to make a motion to move this to the cassette agenda. Second. Okay, motion to refer to the consent agenda made by Councillor Labarge and seconded by Councillor Moult. Any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Councillor Maori. Maybe she's possibly stepped away. Okay. Um, Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Now come back one more time to Councillor Maori. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up is an item we are holding a public hearing for. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and that public hearing will be at our next meeting. And um, that, um, so, what these numbers here mean is that the water rates are not going to change. And that, uh, but also that, uh, that while they are holding steady for this year, there is very likely, likely gonna be changes in the coming year as we're losing one of our biggest customers. Um, so um, I don't know how much of that we wanna go into here, Mayor. But, um, oh. I mean, you, uh, you sort of said what, what I was going to say, which is that, yes, we're, you know, I'm happy to talk about this more at the hearing too, but, you know, we're not recommending a change in rates in the next fiscal year um, because of, you know, sort of the economic volatility and inflation. And, and um, but we do need to start discussing how we're going to address the pressures that are on the enterprise funds and, um, and the upcoming change that you just noted, uh, which is um, Coca-Cola leaving. So um, we do need to start really planning and, and figuring out how we're going to address those changes. Um, but for right now, we are not recommending a change in these rates. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, any thoughts on where to refer this? Councillor Mayori, you've raised your hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, yep, high tech way. I was just gonna say, you know, be, because we're not changing the rates um, and in the spirit of uh, efficiency, I, I would be fine with um, full council taking this up rather than recessing to finance, which would add a little bit more time to the meeting um, you know, I might feel differently if, if there was a major change, but I'm fine with that as chair of finance. Thank you, Councilor Mayori. And thank you for hanging in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the chair of finance is saying uh, that we should probably uh, keep the hearing at uh, city council like we planned and that um and that we don't need to refer this to finance and that um so the hearing will be before the consent agenda at our next meeting um so any thoughts on referring this to the consent agenda Councillor Labarge. Yes um I'm going to echo what the chair said and I'm the vice chair because we are not going up on the right this time. So we do have that hearing coming up. I think it's when the 20, is it the 24th? The 31st. The 31st, thank you, thank you. So I would um, make a motion to move this to the consent agenda. Second. Okay, okay. motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by 
Councillor Moulton to send this to the consent agenda. Um, any discussion? Okay, uh, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Maori. It's me. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. So that the water rates has have gone to the consent agenda and will uh, uh, will be voted on after the public hearing um, at our next meeting. Okay, next up, uh, ordinances in second reading. Uh, we have um, 21.355, an ordinance relative to housekeeping changes to general ordinances. This is in second reading and um, uh, it is up for approval tonight. Yes, I'd make a motion to approve the second reading. Second. Okay, motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Foster to approve 21.355. Uh, any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, uh, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Okay. Yes. Okay. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, that, um, that passes. Um, next up, this is kind of fun for me, is we skip right through 13 because we've done all of that. And now we're up to zoning ordinances in second reading. We have um, item A, which is 21.339, an ordinance to allow beverage service and entertainment at farm stands under certain circumstances. This is in second reading. Yep, I make a motion for the second reading. Okay, so we have second. a motion to approve by Councillor Labarge. Second. Second by Councillor Jarrett. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And Councillor Moulton. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right, that passes in second reading. Uh, now we are up to uh, item B under this, 21.356, an ordinance relative to housekeeping changes to the zoning ordinance. This is in second reading. Move approval. Second. Okay. Uh, motion made by Councillor Jarrett and seconded by Councillor Moulton. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none. Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> we are now up back to resolutions and we have a resolution here, uh, uh, re uh, 22.060, a resolution in support of H 
3126, an act providing for a gender neutral designation on state documents and identifications. This is in first reading and the sponsors um, are uh, Councillor Elkins and Councillors Foster. And um, I tend to let the sponsors of resolutions read their, <laughs> their work into the record. So um, Councillor Foster, Councillor Elkins. Uh, Councillor Foster, may I suggest that uh, we trade off paragraphs? Oh, wow. Uh, sure, Councillor Elkins, that sounds great. Let's get the theater background going, right? Okay, I, <laughs> yes, curveball. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, whereas one in four queer youth identify as non-binary and peer-reviewed research has found that young people whose gender is not recognized by others are more likely to have lower self-esteem, struggle with depression, and consider and attempt suicide, and... Whereas currently in Massachusetts, a person who is neither exclusively male nor exclusively female has no appropriate gender option on a majority of non-ID state forms. And whereas H3126, an act providing for gender neutral, gender neutral designation on state documents and identifications will, will require all state forms and documents requiring individuals to indicate their gender to provide for a gender neutral identification shown as X and. Whereas the Massachusetts Registry of Motor vehicles has allowed for an X gender marker on driver's licenses and ID cards since 2019 via administrative change and whereas 22 states and the District of Columbia all allow non-binary gender identification on at least I on at least state ID and uh, the federal that's a typo and 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 in 2021 the federal government allows allowed for a gender X marker for gender non-binary persons on their passport and Whereas in stark contrast across the country, several states are considering legislation that would put transgender and gender non-conforming young people and their families in grave danger by criminalizing parents, guardians, and medical providers who support children who have a medical need for gender affirming counseling and medical treatment. And whereas the governor of the state of Texas signed an executive order declaring gender affirming, affirming medical care of any kind to be child abuse, and is subjecting families to unprecedented and invasive child welfare investigations and would remove transgen transgender children from their homes and... Whereas other states are seeking to repeal previously passed bans on discredited, costly, and harmful conversion therapy and outlawing school curriculums that affirm and inform young people about diverse gender and sexual orientation identities and... Whereas the Massachusetts Transgender Political Coalition, the Massachusetts GB GLB2... BTQ Political Caucus, GLAD, the ACLU of Massachusetts, Mass Equality, Massachusetts Commission of LGBTQ Youth, Greater Boston PFLAG, and OUT Metro West are all organizations that fully support H3126 and... Whereas the City of Northampton and the Northampton City Council have long supported transgender equality by passing unanimous resolution on August 18th, 2011 in support of the Massachusetts House Bill, adding gender identity as a pr protected category to anti-discrimination laws in employment, housing, education, public accommodations, and credit, unanimously passing a resolution to affirm the city's non-discrimination policy and in support of the equality of access in public places on May 19th, 2016. And on August 10th, 2017, the Northampton School Committee unanimously voted to formalize into policy its commitment to ensure that for students and employees, non-discrimination on the basis of transgender or gender non-conforming status. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton affirms its support for H3126 and asks the state legislature to pass the law allowing for a gender X designation on state forms with haste and... Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be sent to State Senator Joanne M. Comerford, State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, Sponsors Representatives Mindy Dome and Marjorie Decker, and Chair of Ways and Means Committee Representative Aaron Mikulitz. Thank you, Councilors. Okay, um, we have this resolution on the floor. Um, I think uh, <laughs> the next step is to uh, move to approve it. Or no, hold it, it's on, this is the first reading. And that next time will will be for move for for approval. 
Any further discussion before we move on? Uh, Councilor Elkins. Oh yeah, you want to speak to your resolution? Go ahead. <laughs> I do want to speak to my resolution. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, to our resolution. Yeah. Uh, so I I want to start by saying that uh, many of you know that uh, both me and my wife are from uh, Texas. Uh, originally, I'm from Houston. My wife is from Lubbock, Texas. Uh, we both found safe spaces in our homes, and we uh, both come from loving families who traveled their own journeys to uh, come to accept us and our identities and who we are. But I can say for sure that both of us uh, experienced as young people uh, experiences that were lonely and isolating, um, that we experienced uh, bullying, and that we experienced uh, very difficult times being different. Uh, and in a time where neither one of us uh, were able to come out until after high school, after, after college. Um, there was no name for who I was and how I identified uh, when I was a young person. And when I did come out in college, I came to know older queer people who had long endured uh, much worse, much more difficult circumstances uh, where their gender identities, their sexual orientation, uh, some of them were never able to uh, come out and to uh, realize that. And so I came out at the cusp of what my good friend uh, and Northampton neighbor Maxine Schmidt calls the age of miracles. Uh, it was moving toward the end uh, or moving toward a place where HIV and AIDS was moving from being a, a death sentence to a, a chronic but treatable uh, disease. Uh, when I came out, same-sex uh, intimate relations was still illegal in the state of Texas. Gay marriage, of course, uh, came and that changed because of the law. Um, here in Massachusetts, of course, we were the first state to pass uh, gay marriage. And then, of course, it came across the country. It's been astounding to see young people coming out now as queer, as non-binary, um, redefining gender uh, in positive and affirming ways that my generation could have never even uh, imagined. And, uh, and I've chosen to live here, my wife and I have chosen to live here and raise our, our child here because it is the kind of place that it was safe from the jump, that from the moment that she arrived in this city and that she was born at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, we knew she would be safe and within our, within our family and in our identities. And I can say for certainty that the room for diversity, expression of identity and safety forged by the Stonewall generation through the youngest members of our communities has saved countless lives and ensured that young people across multiple generations uh, found room and space to be a part of their communities and to be uh, leaders and to lead, lead productive lives. So to know and appreciate this history, to have lived through this tremendous evolution and to be in this city with its important role in the progress fills, fills me with so much gratitude. And even still to see yet again, an effort to turn the health, safety and well-being of some of our most vulnerable young people into a political football and to put the very integrity of loving homes in jeopardy is nothing short of monstrous. In the face of such bigotry and hate with my home state leading the way, this resolution in support of a law offering dignity, legal protection to non, dignity and legal protection to non-binary people seems like the very least we can do to raise our voices to say, we will raise up and affirm all identities and that is who we are in Northampton. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elkins. Uh, Councillor Foster. Councillor Elkins, that was that was really powerful. Thank you. Um, and you know, when Councillor Elkins asked me to to co-sponsor this resolution, I of course I jumped on board um, right away. And you know, having grown up in Rochester, New York, which is a, a more liberal city, I I understand a little bit of that tension. Um, you know, it was still growing up incredibly hard not to be um, not to be straight and, and to know that and it wasn't safe and it wasn't easy. Um, but at the same time, there was more of a safety net around me than I know many young people in um, communities where 
their cities or their states are actually trying to codify discrimination. Um, you know, and in Massachusetts, which is, you know, we have this potential for a state sponsored designation that says the state sees you, we know you exist, and we will support um, non-binary identification on documents can be a really incredibly powerful statement, um, you know, for government to offer protections to those who are more vulnerable. Um, you know, on a short note um, to what Councillor Elkins was, was talking about, I remember in 2005 taking a road trip with a friend of mine who was transitioning and um, he had to use the bathroom. And that's when I learned that Dunkin' Donuts has single stall bathrooms and those were safe. Um, he wasn't going to go into a highway rest stop and risk using a bathroom and not knowing what he'd encounter. Um, so we drove until there was a Dunkin' Donuts off the exit and that's the bathroom we used because that's where he felt safe. And you know, when, when you have that opportunity to be close to people who um, are willing to, to give you that window into um, some of those very private details of their lives um, and see that, that struggle, you really see the opportunity um, to offer support and to do better. And to think that there are places where parents who are seeking gender affirming care for their children, which is what their children need and loving parents wow. going against um, the trends in their community, going against what the state is saying in order to do what their children need is an incredibly powerful statement of family. And um, to think that in doing that and in providing their children what they need, they may actually risk losing their children or being the subject of state investigation is, is, um, is just kind of terrifying. Um, and so, you know, Northampton has continuously, continuously led the way. It's why I'm here. It's why my family is here. And, um, you know, I, I think this is a, a really powerful time for Northampton to support, um, you know, a, a gender X designation on state documents, which is a simple administrative code that actually says to people, you belong here and, and we support you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Labard. Yes, um, I wanna thank Councilor Elkins. I think you did an excellent job with the language on it and also Councilor Foster. I'm supporting this 100%. And I have to say, Northampton is here to welcome everybody, everybody, and to make you feel safe. And we have it in our family and they feel safe here. Definitely feel safe. And I think no matter who our children are, their moms are mom and their dads, their dads and their moms and their moms are their families. And that's the value there that we keep them all safe. Everybody's safe. So I'm supporting this. I support this bill a hundred percent. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to thank Councillor Elkins and Foster for bringing this forward. Uh, I, I was really moved while both of you were speaking and that, um, that really grateful to have both of you on council um, that, um, and, and, the, and the way you're able to share yourselves in, in a deeply personal way. Uh, so I thank you for doing that. Um, that um, while you were speaking, it, what was going through my mind was, um, last spring I made a email thread for my my mom that um, for her 19 uh, grandchildren and uh, we call it the 19 and the, no parents are, are allowed in the thread it's just grandchildren and and my mom and that um, and in that thread are um, you know that are a bunch of young people who are figuring themselves out yep. and, um, and that they are figuring themselves out in all different ways. 
and um, I'm just really grateful that, you know, that in my life that, you know, that the, um, the affirming experiences that, you know, that uh, are there for them and that, you know, supporting this resolution is part of making that case for everybody. So um, anyway, so I'm gonna be voting in, in for this uh, in support of the 19 to figure, figure themselves out and to love themselves. So any other discussion? Okay, this will be on the agenda for our next meeting and, um, and we can share more love then. <laughs> And that, um, all right, next on the agenda is item number 16, which is discussion of, of whether we're gonna go remote, uh, whether, so we need to uh, make a decision tonight of whether we're gonna continue to be meeting remotely. The governor has allowed us to, uh, he's extended, uh, the, uh, that cities and towns can, uh, uh, governmental bodies can meet remotely until July 15th. And so um, our next meeting will be the 31st. Uh, but after that, we need to have a, um, a we, we need to know how we're going to meet. And so, um, so that is on the table right now. Um, two um, items that are of importance here, pieces of information. Uh, one is that um, uh, part of making this decision is understanding what um, the next uh, process might look like. We've talked about meeting remotely in, in, or in a hybrid form. And uh, I can report that uh, NAM is ready when we're, whenever we are to do a mock-up. So we can get a sense of what it would be like to have a hybrid meeting. And also Laura can report that, um, Laura, why don't, you, why don't you give the little report on, um, on what you found out from uh, Meredith? Sure, um, just uh, before the last meeting when I let her know that the council would be discussing whether to continue meeting remotely, she just let me know that her recommendation would be if the council um, did choose to return in person, that they do so in a hybrid form and that the public continue to participate remotely. And one of the reasons she gave is just that the um, air circulation in council chambers mm -hmm. is not particularly good. They always brought in HEPA filters when they do the vaccination clinics there, unless the windows are wide open. So anyways, just if the council does choose to go back in person, her recommendation is that the public um, continue participating remotely. Thank you. Councillor Jared. Um, are other spaces available? I'm thinking of the JFK community room, which is a larger space and I presume somewhat retrofitted uh, given that the schools have uh, had, you know, been in person for quite a while now. I don't know the exact answer to that. I know in discussions with uh, with Al Williams that that space has come up, um, and uh, so that that is a possibility. I they say they're ready to do uh, to do a mock up, and I don't I don't know where that is. I mean, is Dave here? See, Nam is here. Maybe Dave Newland's here. There he is. Hi, Dave. <laughs> um, uh, in turn, would would a mock-up be at JFK? The setup that I have prepared is in the council chambers. Um, oh, okay. All right. We built that out a couple months ago in anticipation of going back to in-person or hybrid, um, and it's still still there. You know, we haven't done. Uh, an actual uh, test with a full meeting. So I'm sure there are kinks that will show up when we do that, um, but it, it's it's ready to run through and, and we'd be happy to do a demonstration for everybody at some time soon. Excellent. We're Thank still you. working with Antonio and IT for uh, 
uh, activating the community room at JFK for school committee uh, when they choose to go back to hybrid. All right, cool. Thank you, Dave. All right. Um, so I, I think that's, uh, uh, you know, we can do the mock-up. Uh, we can get more information from Meredith about what we need to do to make that room safer. And, um, but, um, but we do need to decide tonight whether or not we're, we're gonna meet remotely. We have some homework we can do over the next three months, but, um, but we need to make a decision on, on meeting remotely. I see Councillor Mayor, he's got her hand up. All right, I'll try to talk without coughing. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I guess um, I, I am personally not going to go into, you know, I'm not really willing, <laughs> I guess, to, um, to meet in person if there's an option for remote. Obviously, if there wasn't a, an option for remote, I'd have to rethink that. But I, I guess, you know, I'm, there's so many reasons, you know, I'm not really confident about where we are at with COVID. I don't think we're going back to any normal. Um, and I guess a bigger question is, is just really re like kind of asking myself why. Um, I mean, there's pros and cons to both in person and remote and, and remote has its frustrations and its limitations. But um, given the option, I mean, I'm finding that in general um, remote is much more democratic, uh, brings much more, you know, much more representation. It, it's kinder to um, counselors who will have to pay $100 for babysitters <laughs> and, you know, live uh, 15 minutes away. So half hour in the car, it, it's easier car uh, in terms of carbon footprint. And I, our space isn't really, you know, incredibly inviting. Um, and so I guess, yeah, I guess the question for me is why I'm, I'm happy to excuse me, try hybrid. Um, I have some concerns about whether that will really scratch the itch of being in person and whether that will kind of disfavor folks who aren't in the room. Um, but so I, I would vote to, um, all that said, I would vote to stay remote. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Labarge, then Councillor Perry. Councillor Labarge, I believe you're muted. I've been really doing a lot of thinking about this and especially like with my family and the illness and so forth. Plus hearing right now that there is a huge, huge uptick in Europe right now with the COVID again, again. And a lot of children coming down with colds and so forth like that. I feel safe myself of staying remote like we have been. And I, I'm, I have to agree with Council Miore. I think we have the time up until July 15th. And I think we'll be able to feel things out about how we are doing in the state of Massachusetts and the city of Northampton here. There still is COVID here in our city. And I, I just feel we shouldn't just say, yeah, okay, we're gonna go back into council chambers. And, you know, I, I have bronchitis myself and everything. And with the installation in there, I'm concerned about this. And I really feel medically and for everybody's safety, I think we need to stay the way we are until we actually know that we are free of the COVID. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Perry, you were next, I think. That's me. Um, I'm gonna pretty much mirror a lot of what was said before from other councillors in that I too am leaning, well, uh, leaning towards staying remote uh, for a number of reasons. For instance, tonight, uh, Council Maori and myself were able to be here despite exactly. being under the weather. Um, I would not feel comfortable coming into a place with you all because I, I don't want to get you sick. 
Um, despite the fact that I do want to spend time in person with everyone, I think that is something that is lacking and there are, are bonds to be formed by being in the same spaces. Uh, but I think right now, if we have the ability to do this remote, I think we should continue doing this because I too believe that we are not done with COVID. Um, on another note, I think that in terms of equity, it's, it is really nice for people who can't drive the distance to city council meetings um, from the public. And I like the fact that the recommendation is to keep the public remote, uh, but any, anything that we do, I think in the future, if we could incorporate some form of hybrid for those who just don't have access to coming down to the city hall would be great. You know, there are people who, you know, can't take the bus and can't make it there. So um, just in an effort to, to be more present for uh, our citizens, I think that's important. Um, and then just personally, uh, as probably the only counselor who does work nights, <laughs> this remote uh, system has been very helpful to me. Um, and I, I do want to return back in person, but this flexibility is really allowing me to do my job and to be there um, and be committed to this job. So, um, you know, I'm, I am leaning towards keeping it remote and working on, on figuring out a hybrid method because I'm really interested in doing that. And I know that Northampton Open Media probably has some great mock-ups. So I'd love to try that out soon. Thank you. <laughs> All of this coffin, I'm glad we're, we're remote. <laughs> yeah, just like um, everyone out. Counselor Foster. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, all the coughing, that was my exact thought too, Councilor <laughs> Yeah, <perfect. laughs> But no, listening, um, Councilor Mayori, Councilor Perry, Councilor Labarge, um, you know, I, I, um, I agree. I am in support of staying remote while the law allows. Um, it does feel honestly more democratic. I've brought that up before, um, you know, that, uh, and it, um, I do love when I get the chance to see you all in person. I think that's great. And, it, and it's really nice to meet in person. Um, I'm not quite sure um, that there's a ton of value in us meeting in person when the, when the public is still remote. Um, here, there is uh, a bit more of an egalitarian feel or kind of a more, you know, we're kind of all together, even though we're not together, um, that I'm appreciating. And then, you know, as we do think about those barriers to public service, um, you know, some of them have been named tonight, and that includes work schedules, um, drive time, um, needs for child care. And I think that's been a really interesting, um, you know, social thing that we've learned um, during this time of remote, remote meetings. And it's not the case tonight, but it has been the case a number of nights that I've been able to participate um, while my children are home and, and my spouse has not been or not been able to care for them. So it's, um, you know, the, the remote meetings have allowed participation for me on nights that um, when it was in person, it wouldn't have been. And I understand we're looking at um, a hybrid format when we do return and I'm excited to explore that. And perhaps we should use some time this spring um, to check out the setup and check out what it looks like hybrid so that when we make the switch, we're ready for it. Um, but, you know, I don't know that we need to make that switch right away. Okay, um, so yeah, I this is this is interesting because I I there's been an evolution on this discussion a bit, and that uh, I know that because um, it this it started with the last council, and 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 it's 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 changed a little bit. Um, I I think it, at the last council we realized that wow we there are a lot of new people that are in now in our meetings. Yep. And this is a very vibrant way to, to have people part of our processes. And then I think we started to discover like, oh, well, this is really convenient. Like when my mom had knee surgery, I was down there <laughs> zooming in from there to, I could be there for my mom, but also be, you know, serve on, on council at the same time. And, um, and that, and now we have this this very cool thing where I think it's four counselors have school aged children and that um, and that we have a select committee that's going to be looking at barriers and how this particular way of 
you know, meeting over remotely has has been very beneficial um, mm. for for parents with young kids. Yep. So um, it, I, I think the thing that's surprising me is like we're almost like, well, maybe we're just going to stay remote. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and I, you know what? Maybe we could do that. Um, I think it would be good. I think it would be good if we try out the hybrid and we see what it's like. And um, and uh, I also want you to know I've I've started having coffee with the, the council president of East Hampton, and so they're wrestling with the same thing. So um, uh, that they uh, uh, Omar has shared with me that they that when they meet uh, in hybrid that right now they're hoping they, the plan is to have um, a quorum present. So if everything went down, that they would have. Um, they could still have the meeting. Um, but, you know, th these are the things we, we would need to start to think through. Um, but we've never had a shutdown of, of our remote <laughs> meetings. So we've had people popping in and out. So anyway, I, I think this is, this is a really great discussion and we'll, we should continue to have it. Uh, but I, I think we should, uh, 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 continue to meet remotely until July 15th. And should the governor allow us to continue that, um, you know, we, and we'll just make plans in the meantime to, you know, based on what comes out of the, the state house. So, um, so I'm gonna make a motion that we continue to meet remotely um, through uh, July 15th. I'll second that motion. Okay, uh, motion made by me and then seconded by Councillor Labarge. And then um, uh, I see Councillor Moulton's got his hand up. Thank you, yeah, I agree with that. And just ask that Nam, uh, um, uh, in its mocking up of a hybrid situation, look at uh, JFK as well as the city council chambers as a possibility of that uh, being used by the council in addition to the school committee because it is a larger room and perhaps perhaps it's better ventilated okay um all right uh councillor jared yeah just want to say that uh, i agree with the decision um and that we you know i i think uh want to make sure we have a commitment to, to hybrid participation by the public um and hybrid participation by the councilors going forward, uh, even even after July fifteenth. Given um, you know we we will if if this order is rescinded, we will have to have a quorum in person, um, and but uh, but you know that would allow up to four of us to be uh, remote. Yeah, and I'd be interested in finding a way to make that happen, Councilor Jarrett, out of support for colleagues to be. Um, to be elsewhere. So, okay, so we have a motion on the floor to stay remote through July 15th. Any more discussion? Seeing none, Laura, roll call, please, from way up in North, uh, in, in Deerfield. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. <laughs> and Councillor Perry. Yes. Okay. So that brings us to new business. Is there any new business? Seeing none, the next thing on the agenda is a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Okay. Um, there's no discussion on adjourning. Uh, Laura, roll call, please. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Gore. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. <laughs> Yes. Okay. We are adjourned. Everybody go home and 
We are home already. Take yeah. care of yourself. There's too much coughing going on. I know. I triggered everyone. Hope you feel better, Eric. <laughs>